So I would say if the government passes a property tax on Bitcoin, you should leave the country. I would say if they're going to capital gains tax it, you should manage yourself so you don't have to transfer it very often, almost never. And I would say if they made it legal tender, then you probably ought to move to that country. You ought to go the other direction. In a recent interview with Michael Saylor at Bitcoin Park, he details the intricacies of Bitcoin and its implications on government and taxes. Michael Saylor explores the complexities of Bitcoin and its benefits, highlighting its significance in the current financial landscape. At the time of this discussion, Bitcoin is around $59,000, with under an 8% increase in the last 24 hours and a 7% decrease in the last 7 days, with over 19 million Bitcoins in circulation. Before we dive into this enlightening discussion, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this channel for more financial insights, market analyses, and Bitcoin updates. Now, let's hear more from Michael Saylor as he shares his perspectives on the current markets and Bitcoin. There's a phrase in Wall Street, if the ducks are quacking, feed the ducks. They want that. There's another group of people, they want equity in a public company. They can't buy the spot ETF. They can't. It's, a, it's against their charter. They get fired. They just can't. Why don't they? <laughs> well, like, you're questioning the world. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, the world is made up of huge pools of capital and it might have taken 20 years to raise the money. Now I got to spend the money. So if you are the entrepreneur, my general message is you can create a security that a capitalist can then use to get Bitcoin exposure. And if you're public, you sell public equity or debt and buy Bitcoin. And if you're private, you'll sell private equity or private debt and buy Bitcoin. If you can't raise money, then you just got to work very, very hard and get lucky. And it's hard. And you'll see a Zuckerberg on occasion. You'll see some breakthroughs. But, you know, it's like it's not easy. And so I, my recommended strategy is not work yourself to death. My recommended strategy is notice that there are $450 billion of capital in bonds and real estate and traditional 20th century assets. There's one trillion. So there's 450 trillion in those things. There's one trillion in Bitcoin. You should be the conduit to move the next trillion dollars from the old world to the new world. And the way you do it is by raising money with issuing securities to buy Bitcoin. And you solve. What's the problem you solve? Custody it for them. Buy it for them. Take away the volatility. Take away the downside risk. You know and then solve the compliance issue. Chinese billionaires got to buy Bitcoin through a Shanghai ETF, otherwise it goes to jail. Right. That's the problem you solve. It's not as good as self-custody. <laughs> it's not as good as the raw Bitcoin, but that's academic because when you've got $10 billion and your choice is buy a billion this way or go to jail or don't buy any, the answer, the world is imperfect. That's why they call it earth, not heaven. The real issue is when you're doing a transaction, what is the impedance? And there's, there's a source of physical impedance. Like, for example, what do I think of gold as a transactional currency? Well, like, I don't think it's good because it's hard to subdivide it and it's hard to send it over the mail. And so you can see how there's a high energy cost to trade gold high frequency. That's why it died. Um, on the other hand, like, what do I think of Apple stock? as a transactional currency. And here you just get into politics. In a country where Apple stock was legal tender, if it's legal tender and I can send it to you and you could send it back to me and I can do it in one second with no tax, then, you know, wow, Apple stock is better than gold. Now, what do I think of the dollar as, as legal, uh, as a transactional currency? Well, what I think is I can send it back and forth a million times a day and I don't have a million taxable events and so I don't have to account for it. If I send a capital asset, whether it's a corporate bond, an equity, Bitcoin in the US, if you're in the US now, if I move it, I'm moving it at high frequency and I'm incurring an accounting event and a taxable event. And if you, if you do the calculation, it just turns out that everything just costs 10 or 20% more. And, and so 
I don't, if we were talking about a country, El Salvador, where it's legal tender, and I can move it back and forth a hundred times a month, and there is no accounting event, and there's no taxable event, then my opinion is, if it's Satoshi's on lightning, I kind of like it. If it's Satoshi's over the base layer, I, I think at some point the friction is, you know, when it's three dollars a transaction, yep. there's too much friction. So I don't like it on the base layer. I do like it on the second layer. But I would counsel anybody that if you had a if you had a certain amount of money, 95 percent of it should be held in the capital account as Bitcoin. Five percent should be in the local checking account. I think the government can basically destroy any asset by the tax treatment. I, politics matter. Like if they want to destroy it, right? Then, for example, you know, here's the best tax treatment: legal tender, no, no. tax on it. You can hold it forever, and you can transfer it, and there and there's no tax. I What's mean, the second best, which is capital gains or property? What's the last best? Property tax, which is a tax on time. Like you're holding it, and I want one percent of it. You know, I want one percent of the market value every year, regardless of whether you trade it, right? And and that's the land tax in the U.S. And that takes your money away from you in 35, 40 years. As we just heard Michael Saylor passionately discuss the transformative potential of Bitcoin, let's dive deeper into his views on Bitcoin's future trajectory. Saylor elaborates on the reasons behind the growing interest in crypto, providing insights that challenge conventional thinking. This discussion highlights key takeaways and unique perspectives such as the impact of regulatory changes and the role of Bitcoin in financial sovereignty. Now, let's listen to what Michael Saylor has to say about the evolving landscape of digital currencies. It's positive that they're all talking about it. The Overton window has shifted. A year ago, no one would discuss it. Now you've got, you know, you've got Robert F. Kennedy talking about it. You've got a bunch of senators talking about it. Uh, so I just think we start with a conversation. I keep my expectations low. I think we should all keep our expectations low, but with the observation that when a government starts talking about owning it, they legitimize it, and that means what they're not talking about is taking it away from you. So when they're not talking about owning it, like if you look at the German government, they emergency sold it because it could go to zero. And so the narrative of it's not an asset and it's a, you know, it's a criminal thing and it's going to zero. That thing is pernicious. And if you want to move forward, you have to put a firm foundation. So I think when the government starts talking about it, that means that individuals and small companies will feel comfortable enough to move in. They'll move first. They'll front run, right? The government's always going to be slow. It's always going to be ham fisted. There'll be a lot of fighting. But I think the individuals and families will move. I think if the government's considering it, it becomes a lot less risky for you to discuss it in the board meeting. So when I go into a boardroom and they ask me, I'm, I can say, you know, MicroStrategy is doing it, but guess what? Here are all the politicians that have this bill. And the question is, will I get fired if I propose it? So I think the Overton window is shifting. I, I'm not expecting, you know, that a government's going to buy a ton of Bitcoin tomorrow and put it on the wire. I think I think you have to discount that. I do think we will over the next four years see some government start to take a position. It'll probably come out of the blue. It'll probably be someone you didn't expect and it'll be a good thing. But my I generally think this this plays out over epics four years. This is the early institutional phase, then another four, then another four. Yeah, I mean, I, I just came from a, a presentation on the stage, and what I said was, you know, that the 10% the, the or strategy for the U.S. would be to buy 500,000 Bitcoin. The BTC, the maxi strategy is they should buy a million. The double maxi strategy is they should buy 2 million. And the triple max strategy for the U.S. is they ought to buy 4 million Bitcoin over the next four years. They would have like 18%. Of the of the supply, and if they did that, they retire the debt and they flip to a massive surplus. And and I, you know, my precedent is. Like the secret to success as a nation state is you have defensible, productive property. 
And so the reason that the British Empire rose is they had an island and it was hard to invade it. Nobody got to it after 1066. And that, on that island, they industrialized. And then they got the, the colonies and that was defensible, productive land. And then the reason the US rose to power is the United States is defended by the Pacific on one side, the Atlantic on the other side, frozen tundra to the north, a desert to the south, defensible, productive. And what we do? Well, we bought Louisiana territory. Jefferson did it for 15 million bucks and he bought 27% of the land mass. Seward bought Alaska, $7 million. The United States federal government owns 28% of the land in the US, we own whatever, 18% of the gold or something. So scarce, desirable property, but by productive property that you can defend. And so if hundreds of trillions of dollars are migrating to cyberspace, right? My view is Bitcoin's gonna demonetize Siberian real estate and Chinese real estate and everything in Africa. And why would you wanna own bonds of a South American company? Why would you wanna own anything other than Bitcoin? So as the capital flows, you're gonna see hundreds of trillions of dollars there. So if you're the United States, what are you worried about? Losing your world reserve currency status. Where's the money gonna to go? To Bitcoin. How do you hedge that? Just go to, go to where everybody's going and buy 20% of it. And then when they get there, you know, you'll be fine. Now, where else are you gonna go, right? For example, if you're, if you're gonna sell the dollar, right, you're not selling the dollar for the peso, the lira, the euro, nobody wants any of that. So when you sell the dollar, you're gonna buy Siberian real estate? No, you're gonna buy, buy Bitcoin, what's the second best? You're gonna buy a sec nothing second best. To watch the full, unfiltered interview with Michael Saylor, check out the link in the description. In this compelling discussion, Saylor addresses the adoption of Bitcoin's pivotal role in shaping the future economy. He explores how Bitcoin's decentralized nature challenges traditional financial institutions and offers a new paradigm for economic empowerment and stability. We would love to hear your thoughts on some questions. What role do you think Bitcoin will play in the future of finance? How do you see government regulations impacting Bitcoin's growth? Thank you for tuning in to Only the Savvy. If you enjoyed this discussion, please subscribe, like, and share our video for more engaging content diving into the innovative world of decentralized technologies.